Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. The Boeing B-52 bomber is one of the most iconic aircraft in history. Nicknamed the Stratofortress, it was first developed back in the 1950s when it was intended to drop bombs over potential Cold War targets. Since then, it has served as a strategic bomber and a reconnaissance plane Not only is it one of the oldest still-serving aircraft in the United States arsenal, but it's the longest-running, continually manufactured plane in the Boeing portfolio. At 159 feet long, 185 feet from wingtip to wingtip, and 185,000 pounds empty, the B-52 is a truly massive machine. And since its weight can reach over 488,000 pounds when fully fueled and loaded, engineers have long had to come up with unique ways to get this behemoth into the air and to bring it to a safe stop. On average, it takes about an hour to get a B-52 warmed up and ready to fly. Considering this particular bomber was designed to answer thermonuclear threats, such a long prep time proved quite problematic for U.S. military commanders. On the ground, the massive B-52 is just another target. Not only is it pretty much defenseless, but it can't attack any enemy targets either. The solution to this problem was the cart start. This highly unique approach uses small, controlled explosive charges to get the bomber's eight Pratt & Whitney TF-33 turbofans ready to go in a much shorter time. In fact, it's estimated that the cart start method can get the plane up in the air in less than 10 minutes. To this day, cart start practice is essential for all air and ground crews working with the B-52. Throughout the more than 70 years it's been serving the U.S. military, the B-52 has been upgraded and redesigned several times over. However, it still uses many of the old analog systems included in the original design. Though there is a steep learning curve for these various systems and avionics, they have since evolved from a largely negative feature into a positive one. Without as many digital systems on board, the B-52 is highly resistant to electromagnetic pulse attacks and other forms of electronic warfare. The 
cockpit has remained virtually the same since the 1950s, though new computer systems have been integrated whenever possible. Many active B-52s today are G or H models with upgraded engines, reinforced structural elements, and new armament options. Stopping the B-52 is an entirely different matter. In many cases, crews will deploy a drogue parachute in order to help the massive bomber decelerate and come to a stop. These parachutes are stored at the rear of the aircraft, typically inside a special device that allows them to be deployed remotely. Unlike conventional parachutes, drogue parachutes are more elongated and have much less surface area. This generates less drag and allows the chute to be deployed at higher speeds. It's imperative that the chute not be deployed too early, as it's not uncommon for pilots to have to re-accelerate and take back off should something go wrong after touchdown. Accomplishing this in a fast-moving B-52 is hard enough without having to fight the deceleration chute as well. Whenever a new drogue parachute is delivered to an airbase, it must be carefully evaluated and inspected by trained personnel. It's their job to ensure the parachute and deployment mechanism have no defects or other problems that might prevent a safe landing. The B-52 is far from the only aircraft to ever use a parachute. For instance, Fighter jets like the F-4 Phantom often employed parachutes to aid them during difficult landings. The F-4 was the primary fighter aircraft of the Vietnam War, when pilots were often tasked with landing at less well-equipped air bases than what they were used to. In order to bring the 40,000-pound plane to a safe stop, it made sense to employ a drag chute. Over the years, more than 5,000 total F-4 Phantoms were produced. Some even remain in operation to this day, primarily as training aircraft or for use at air shows and other events. Modern aircraft are often tested with drogue chutes as well. In fact, the U.S. military's latest state-of-the-art fighter, the F-35 Lightning, underwent extensive drag chute testing by the Norwegian Royal Air Force. In this case, the goal was to help decelerate the aircraft in icy conditions where it might be difficult for the plane, which can weigh up to 65,000 pounds fully loaded, to come to a safe stop. Of course, Parachutes have been essential to various military operations since the dawn of flight. From bombs to personnel to vehicles, they allow various objects to be safely dropped from aircraft without needing to come in for a landing. This is especially important in potentially dangerous areas with no airfield or landing strips. <laughs> Over the years, the cargo drop has become absolutely vital to military operations all around the world.
Using large cargo planes like the C-17, the military can drop enormous amounts of supplies and equipment in minutes without ever having to touch the ground. The cargo is first placed on pallets. A self-deploying parachute is then attached to these. Since modern cargo planes have rollers installed on the floors, the crews need only lower the rear loading ramp and allow the pallets to roll out the back. The parachutes do the rest. During World War II, Parachutes allowed for the insertion of armed personnel close to and even behind enemy lines. These airborne divisions became known as paratroopers and were integral in surprise attacks and missions designed to help seize bridges and other strategic locations. Nowadays, there are numerous paratrooper divisions spread out all around the world. These men and women are generally crammed into cargo planes while loaded with equipment and other necessities. As they approach their target, they will hook their rip cords up to static lines. When they jump out of the cargo bay or side door, the line automatically pulls the cord, ensuring their chutes deploy safely every time. Using the pallet system, it's possible for aircraft like the C-17 to drop all manner of items. Because of the sheer size of the cargo bay on these aircraft, personnel can follow these vehicles almost immediately. This means that an entire force can be armed mobilized and mission ready in just a few minutes. Though exiting out of the back or side of a moving aircraft is perfectly safe for passengers and cargo, those responsible for flying the plane are in a much tougher situation. Pilots, co-pilots, and navigators do wear parachutes. Still, they need to be propelled from the craft with an ejector seat in a last resort situation. Otherwise, they risk being hit by parts of the aircraft's tail, wings, or engine. The first ejector seats used a bungee system, but after World War II, rocket-propelled seats became the standard. Aircraft speeds were getting faster all the time, so it became imperative that these seats meet specific performance criteria. Because they are designed to save lives in an emergency, all aircraft egress systems undergo extensive inspections and repairs over the course of their service life. This is done by technicians at the Air Crew Egress System Shop. These highly trained specialists remove the entire seat system, take it apart, and perform any and all maintenance. Of course, the pilots themselves also require training in how to handle their egress equipment. Since it would be costly and impractical to do this inside a real aircraft, the military has set up mock cockpits that provide pilots with a real-life ejection experience. 
There's even a virtual reality parachute testing program, which instructs them on how to deal with potential parachute issues. Because as vital as they are to the global mission, parachutes can never be 100% foolproof. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.